What's happening, YouTube? You're back in the building with the Black Avengers of Current Culture, me, Lamont, T-Streams, and Larry. We are here for the people, and we've got a star-studded show going on. Great issues to cover. Larry T-Streams, how you feeling? Man, I'm good. I don't know about you guys, but I'm actually feeling good right now. Yeah, man, I'm solid. Everything's everything. My wife baked a cake today, so I'm about to get up out of here and go eat some cake. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but oh, everything's Lord. good, man. Everything's, everything's good. Well, I'm trying to enjoy the last three days of being in my 30s. I'll hit 40 on May 7th, and I just want to give y'all a ruckus time, let off some bad words, and say that I'm leaving it in my 30s. That was my youth. There now you go. I'm moving to the mid part of my life. Yeah. So what are we covering on the show today? We've got the Centoya Brown review for Netflix, Murder to Mercy. We're going to talk about that. Last Stand, Chicago Bulls documentary, five and six. We got you there. Something that we mentioned on this channel a couple of weeks ago, Erica Badu versus Jill Scott. And the only people that was talking about it a few weeks ago was this channel. I think somebody heard it and passed it along. We've got some Marvel leaks. We've got money. We're going to be doing a $1,000 giveaway, $500 giveaway to two people. We're going to discuss the Robin Hood stock investing app. And last but not least, Larry's favorite Republican, Candace Owens, got her ass banned from Twitter. <laughs> so let us start with the, the Centaur Brown Netflix review, right. Murder to Mercy. Do either one of you guys know about her story, just in a quick nutshell? Now, isn't this the young lady that like she was like into uh, well, she was like a part of sex trafficking or something. And she ended up killing her. She ended up killing her. Whoever was her is, trafficker. Yeah. Is it something? Kinda, yeah. You in the ballpark. So basically, the synopsis of the story is um, you had a 16 year old girl that was Mrs. Brown and she had a boyfriend she was with who was kind of her pimp. Yeah. And she went off on her own to sign it. And she met this white dude named Johnny Allen. He was supposed to be some big wig in the community. He picks her up, takes her to her house, shows her all these guns, tell her he does real estate, tell her he's a big somebody in the community. They go to the bed. He pays her $150 for her to perform a sex act. Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, the chick is 16 years old. After they got into some verbal altercations in the bedroom, he started talking about a gun. She said she feared for his life. So she pulled out an illegal handgun she had in her, her pocketbook and shot him out of fear for her life. And long story short on that is they held her in jail from age 16 to 18. And then they had her trial at 18 where all these people, not only did they convict her, but mm -hmm. they said she was um, convicted of robbery, possession of a handgun, um, first degree murder. I mean, they threw the book at her. And the weird issue in Tennessee is they have some of the most harsh rules against people who are under the age of 18. So for her, it's an automatic 50 years with no parole. Well, throughout this story, you find some people who decide how in the world could they come to this type of conclusion against this girl being so young? Yes, she was into prostitution. She had a horrible background. Her mama was an Anglo-Saxon, gave her up at like eight months old to a black lady. And as you dig deeper into the story, they decided to do a retrial because they just could not believe that they sent this chick up the river. So what they wound up digging up was her biological mother had a history in the family of alcoholism so bad that they were saying it was a genetic issue. So that brought them to try to retrial. Ladies and gentlemen, didn't work. They looked at this girl and they was like, hell to the no, you're still not getting out. And it eventually went to the governor for clemency. By this point in time, you're talking this a decade later, she's gone to school in jail, all this reform. She, she's, in essence, she was femininely emasculated. If you could see the level of begging they had this girl doing to the white masters to get freedom, it'll make your heart sink. Long story short, the governor gave a clemency and reduced her sentence, and she was able to get out August 2019. But 
the issue that bothered me the most was I don't understand how the jury and the DA, mind you, didn't find somewhere in their heart where they could believe that this little girl feared for her life. When they showed you evidence that this guy that died, that she shot, had several big guns. Um, they didn't talk about what his real position was other than being a real estate agent. And not to mention, he picked the girl up under age. So a lot of things come to your mind about this case. And it got so bad, fellas, that they eventually passed a Centaur Brown law against giving punishment to people under the age, um, under age 18 because of what they've done to her and others. Giving you guys that background, T-Streams, I'm going to give it to you first. What do you think? Man, what, well, what? I tell you what, man. They don't call it the dirty, dirty for nothing down there, man. Uh, I, I, I tell you. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the law system is jacked up all over the U.S., but down south, man, it is it is horrible, man. And, and I'm, talking, I'm talking from experience. You know, I, I live down there. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in Arkansas and uh, had a little taste of their system down there. And, and it's not, you know, it's not anything nice. The whole deal with the kids and stuff, man, it surprises me how they, you know, how they can even do something like that, you know, in cases now they, they, they find it, you know, that, you know, it's illegal. You can't sentence a kid to life and all this other kind of stuff. But hell, I knew kids that, you know, you know, I knew people that were locked up as kids, you know, uh, that were on death row. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, I'm glad she did get a chance to get out because mm -hmm. um, everybody don't everybody don't get that chance. You know, uh, clemency is one of them. Them Hail Mary throws them. Them last. Mm -hmm. You know, after you didn't exhausted other other things, what surprises me though is that it did take so long, and then you do have other circumstantial evidence that shows that, hey, she might have been the victim of of a predatory act, mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. and so instead of looking at it in light, you know, instead of looking at it in light of that, maybe you know, maybe they thought she brought all the heavy artillery in. Maybe, maybe she thought that, that maybe they thought that she cahoots him and all this other kind of stuff It's you know, it's no telling man, but I tell you, uh, the penal system down South is terrible. Larry, I'm a pastor to you, but I've got to give this caveat before you go. Go ahead. Would the jurors behave the same way if this was Susie blonde that shot the white guy or mm -hmm. not and i'm gonna pass it to you no i mean we know for a fact that there's a that there's definitely differences in the way that people respond to black people versus white people this would not have happened if if, if the, the that this conviction would not have happened if it, if literally they would have seen a little blonde girl and she would have put on some tears and said that this man picked her up and took advantage of her. And, you know, because it was a white guy, I mean, they may have not have given him any sort of may they, they may not have done anything to him. Well, I mean, he was dead, but, you know, they may have just basically said, well, hey, she's been a victim of sex trafficking and we're just going to go ahead and let her go and say it's self-defense. But Part, part of the problem is with black women, they have said this, not just in the area of, of criminal justice, but in other areas, they say that people generally look at black girls as much older than what they actually are. Mm -hmm. So they say that people will look at, say, like a 13 year old black girl and they'll look at her as if she's 18 or something and, they'll, and they treat them accordingly. And they're not. They're young girls. So you may look at this 16 year old girl and think she's you know, that she's 20 or 21 or 25, but she's not, she's a 16 year old child. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and the thing is with prosecutors is that they just don't, they, they, they often know that they, there have been mistakes made. We have seen this happen time and time again throughout the course of our, of our nation's history and you know, the history of our judicial system. And it happens, I think mostly with black and brown people, but it does happen with some white people where there will be a wrongful conviction 
And we will see where the prosecutors have had withheld evidence or new evidence was there, but didn't present it after the fact. There was evidence that they knew could exonerate someone mm -hmm. and prove this person was actually innocent. But because they already had a conviction, they suppressed that evidence. And so we've seen this happen time and time again. And so for a prosecutor to not change and, and to say, well, we're not going to make any adjustments to our, our sentencing recommendations or or we're not going to, you know, we're still going to convict or whatever. It just, it seems to me, it's just more of the same. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like my, my mom was, my mom, who's an attorney, was a prosecutor for a number of years that, you know, at the county level where she did criminal prosecutions and later at the state level as an AG. And she was often horrified by what she saw and mm -hmm. what she experienced. And she had a lot of conflicts with her bosses because she was often asked to do certain things that she knew was just not, was, was, was not right. I mean, mm -hmm. and even, I mean, it's one thing when you have all the protections of the law behind you, so you can do whatever you want to do and know, and know that you're not going to suffer any consequences of it, you know, but it's another thing when you have to go home and you have to look yourself in the mirror and eventually she just couldn't do the job. And so she left, but I mean, we see this happen time and time again with prosecutors, you know, they, they're put in these situations where they they're willing to basically say, we don't really care about justice. We don't really care about right and wrong, innocent or guilty. What we care about are conviction rates. Right. And, right. and we're going to go after and keep our conviction rates high. And we are going to protect those convictions once they have been made, regardless of whether or not we made mistakes or if someone broke the law in the process of getting those convictions. It doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show, for those of you that have never seen uh, Mrs. Brown, I'm going to show you a clip directly from the Netflix documentary, then I'm going to summarize it for you. Candace Owens, a conservative commentator and online activist. Oops, my DJ messed up. That's the wrong clip. Here we go. <laughs> Now, celebrities like Rihanna, T.I., and Lana Del Rey are tweeting for clemency for Centoya. I want to go home, and I can't. Let's see what the governor says. So for, for me, after watching the documentary, and I did read where um, editorial control was not held by Mrs. Brown. So there were some things that she took opposition to but overall i think it did get the message through about what happened mm -hmm. it just broke my heart that you had other americans sitting on that damn jury and just thought to convict this girl on everything every charge that they put against this girl they convicted her knowing that she was 16 knowing that this was a grown-ass man over the age of 40 knowing that the the the, the onus of understanding you're with the minor usually falls as an issue for the adult. It doesn't matter to me that the girl was involved in street life and <clears throat> prostitution. She felt like she feared for her life. There was clear evidence that this man had guns in his house, under his bed and everywhere. And he made some damning statements as elocuted by her. And it just, in overall essence, breaks my heart that this girl lost about 15 years of her life dealing with individuals who didn't have any remorse as if it could have been their daughters. Uh -huh. So that's why I'm going to lead you guys on that one. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Now, fellas, I got to take you guys back to the last stand with Michael Jordan. And boy, they trying to get him too. <laughs> take a look. <laughs> take a look at the excerpt from episodes five and six. Players giving out sensitive information to the press is one surefire way to cause a division within the team. I didn't contribute to that. And that was Horace. <clears throat> he was telling everything that was happening within the group. And everybody talked about Michael, and then everybody talked about everybody else. I mean, that really pissed off Horace. If you guys <laughs> haven't been watching this documentary and it's uncensored, it is really, really good. Mm. It took me back to my youth when I was 13 years old watching some of those games that was going on in 93. The yeah. last two episodes is basically about number one. The first episode was his interaction with the dream team and how they had a game in which Magic Johnson was giving him the business. And he talked so much trash to him that it flipped the switch in Jordan's head. And <laughs> everybody on that group would say, 
Michael Jordan turned into something they have never, ever seen in their life. He took it over. Now, mind you, everybody that was on that dream team is in the 50 greatest players ever. Right. Shout out Mike Willie. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to give you one of my, my visual emoji cons in a second, but they said they flipped the switch and Michael Jordan went nuts and they still to this day feel like he's the greatest basketball player. And y'all know what happened with the dream team. Another yeah. issue that came up was a big election in the state of North Carolina, Harvey Gantt versus Jesse Helms. And when you talk about some of the most racist politicians ever, your top five is going to start with Jesse Helms. He's one of the most racist ever. And Michael Jordan's mother was a little upset that her son didn't come out and was a little bit more supportive of Harvey Gantt, who was a black guy. Right. He did contribute to his campaign, but... Mm -hmm. Gracefully, he didn't do anything, and that's when we heard the little slogan come out where Michael Jordan said, Republicans buy shoes too. So right. that came out, and it, it got to a point where Barack Obama even said himself he was disappointed Jordan didn't intervene. However, even though I feel that same way, I confer with Michael Jordan. He said he didn't get involved with politics because he didn't have knowledge of it. He didn't know Harvey Gantt, but he sent him money. So I'm kind of like, you know, MJ, if you send him money, learn what he's about and be a voice for the people. You could have done that in a way where you wouldn't have detracted from people that's going to buy your shoes. I still think they would have bought his shoes. Well, he, then, he sent him money because his mom, he he said he talked to his mom about yeah, it. And, and yeah. so he said, well, he told his mom, I'm not going to say anything, but I'll I'll donate. So I think right. his donation to Gantt wasn't so much of, I know him and I want to support him. It was really more so of I'm supporting my mom and my mom's interest here. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. So you had that part. And then they moved to the next episode where they got more into the, they claimed the media was trying to make a dynamic that Jordan's Achilles heels was his gambling. So they got into the New York Knicks Eastern Conference Finals. They go down two games. Jordan goes to the casino with his dad, stayed out late. They start saying that they was losing because of his gambling. Then Jordan come back, blow him out the water. That was never a problem. And then yeah. that just kind of brings us to him beating Charles Barkley and the boys, winning another championship. I'm going to give this one to you first, Larry. Of all these things that they're talking about in this documentary with Jordan, do you feel like gambling was an issue for him? Um. I'm not sure if gambling was I – well, I, I do think that he has a gambling problem. And do and you there, think it's more of a gambling problem versus an addiction to competition? I mean, he definitely has no, I think he has a problem with gambling. He may have a problem with competition as well, but I think he has a problem with gambling because there's people that like to compete, and there are people that will be competitive in everything they do without introducing money into it. Mm -hmm. So, you know. I think it's just, I mean, like, for instance, an example of that, when he went, when um, I think it was Paxton was talking about when they were on the plane mm -hmm. and they were over there playing, they had two different card games going. They had the one in the back with all the high, you know, all the high stake stuff. And in the front where they were playing for like a dollar a hand. <laughs> and he said Jordan came up there and wanted to play with them and said he just want, he, they said, why do you want to play with it? He said, I just want to say I have your money in my pocket. I think that's I think that in its sense was just a competition thing. I think when he was in the back playing for high dollars was his gambling thing. He likes to gamble. And I think he has I mean, he may not have a gambling he, well, let's say I think he has a gambling problem because he has so much money, mm -hmm. it has not been a financial burden to him. It's right. not like other mm -hmm. people who, you know, who may blow their rent or can't make their child support payment because they were at the casino because he's so rich, he can gamble and, and be just fine, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe because he recognizes it so much, he's able to, to, to modulate that. He's able to moderate his, his, uh, his gambling amount. So he may say, okay, well, I'm not going to play at the million dollar a hand table. I'm only going to play at the $10,000 a hand table, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, Everything that I've heard from him, the dude gambles on everything. They showed him up there. I mean, do you remember being in, in 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 grade school and pitching pennies against the wall with your friends? I mean, the dude's up there with security pitching quarters against the wall. I mean, 
Two, this two, got a problem. Two, two strings. I'm gonna pass it to you, but yeah. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you this caveat too. Um, he also had to go to court because there was this shady individual who did. He was basically like, um, now I'm not gonna say he was a bookie, but you know how you have the pool shark. This mm -hmm. guy with a Jerry curl was the golf shark, and he wound up getting convicted of a crime. And Michael Jordan wrote him a check for fifty-seven thousand dollars, which he yeah. first lied and said it was um, repayment for a loan. Yeah, repayment for a loan when really it was gambling debt. So yeah. with, with that caveat, do you feel like him not getting involved in politics and the gambling have knocked him back a peg or two? Yeah. See the you know the uh, the gambling thing, man is. That has all that has always sort of shrouded him, mm -hmm. you know, as long as I can remember. It's always been like a little issue with him and his uh and his gambling. Um the deal with the politics came into play only recently, you know, you know, that that had come into play on only really only re recently. Damn, I keep stuttering. And so as a as a result to that, you know, I think it sort of had had given people that had once looked at Jordan in a certain way, look at him a lot different because now it seems like, OK, you have put yourself so far oh. up here. Uh oh, no, hold, every everybody that super chatted. As soon as T-Streams is done and we get ready to move, I will play all your visual stimulus. Boy, I got some good ones for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I think what it is is he ended up putting himself so far in a different caliber that folks started, you know, folks started shunning. And then they started, what they started doing was actually separating him as a person from his career in basketball. Mm -hmm. but, and that's sort of that's sort of sort of what I did. You know, I like Jordan as a basketball player, as a person. I still think he's a wet. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think he's just I just think he's not like he's not one of us, you know. And so um, but I do think his I do think his gambling set him back. And then when when that issue came up, whether whether it was him supporting his mom, you know, or or and, and walking into something blindly, or just using that as a you know as an escape go. I think that sort of had you know you know some kind of irreparable damage as well. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, I must make sure y'all know T Strings is very partial to Isaiah Thomas because he's from Detroit. <laughs> so you know, take everything he says about MJ with a grain of salt. Yeah. See, Isaiah is actually from Chicago, though. I know he's from there, but when you think of Isaiah, most people think of Detroit. Nobody thinks thinks of Chicago unless you know. Yeah. I, thought, I thought he was from Indiana. No, that's that's Larry Bird. Larry Bird. Larry Bird. So yeah. to, to summarize it for you guys, and then I'm going to shout out my Super Chat people, and we'll move to the next subject. I'm A part of what Larry said is how I feel about it. It never posed so much of a problem for Jordan that it cost him, you know, financial means yeah. or it's creeped into his gameplay. So for me, it's not a thing. It's, you can gamble if you want to. It's legal. The NBA never slapped him on a wrist. But if it was someone of lesser means, as Larry said, and you had that kind of predilection to gambling, you could lose your house, you could lose your family, all that stuff. But because Jordan was so rich, it didn't cause an issue, nor did it seem like it hemmed up his ability to continue to make money. So for me, it's not a problem. The only problem I have with Jordan is he I felt like because he was a, a black hero, whether he wanted to accept it or not. Mm -hmm. He later in the documentary goes on to say, you know, I'm not a role model, kind of like what Charles Bartley said. But at the end of the day, no matter how much you say you're not, you are. Yeah, people, I, don't, people, I don't buy that. Yeah, people watch you. Plus, Jordan kept a very squeaky clean upfront image. Hence, he went and did a special interview with Ahmad Rashad to clear up the issues about his gambling, which lets right. you know he's concerned about how that was tainting his image. And right. so I my 
my bone with him more so is in an issue of politics when we're dealing with a guy, Hart, um, um, Jesse Helms, who wound up winning and then say we're not going to play in the mud, which was a backhand compliment. I mean, a backhand disrespect to the black people. That you wasn't even backhanded. That I, was just straight up. He said something about there's no celebrating in Mudsville or yeah, something. Yeah, man. That's just open handed. Forgive me for that. That's just open handed. I felt like he could have he could have done more on that front. Having said those things, the documentary is still good. It gives you a lot of insight. And I'm going to move the fellas on to the next subject. But first, Buzz meant quarters and my folk, Mike Willie. Mike Willie, I got a special one for you. I'm going to give Mike Willie this one because I know he dibba dabbles in politics. I represent the rent that's too damn high party. Playing a silly game, but it's not going to happen. The rent too damn high movement, the people I'm here to represent can't afford to pay their rent. Listen, someone stomach, chill, child stomach, just growl. Did you hear it? Rent is too damn high. <laughs> <laughs> man i love that guy and, i love that guy okay and for my folk buzz i got this one for you baby cocaine is a hell of a drug <laughs> <laughs> okay and last but definitely not least for my man mick quarters baby because you hold this channel down so long, you should already know you are. It's my team. It's my quarterback. <laughs> yeah, That's my guy, man. That's my quarterback. He, he super chat every time. So anytime you all super chat, I've got some oh. visuals for you to keep you smiling. Now, fellas, oh. we started this. I think they should give us some credit. Hell, right. e either Jill Scott or Erica Badu should let us sit room side with them, social distancing per se, because we got this started. Hey, before, we, before we go there, can I tell you a funny little segue into the whole Jill Scott, uh, please, Erica please. Badu thing with Michael Jordan, right? Oh, boy. So, so years ago, I think I told you guys, I worked as a photographer for a long time. When I was in L.A., I did a lot. Of, I was a you know, I, I did a lot of stuff in the music industry and I worked for a bunch of record labels and, and for the Source magazine, some other folks. So I was I was in that place space all the time. And I went to um, I went to a, uh, a a launch party for Hidden Beach Records which was Michael Jordan's label. And he was, so they were doing the launch party for uh, for his record label and they were introducing Jill Scott. They were bringing her out. And so it was a, it was a cool thing where it was just, you know, it was a big event and, um, and she was going to perform and stuff. So I was there taking photos and whatnot. And, um, and so I knew Michael Jordan was there. I hadn't got a chance to photograph him yet. So anyways, I, but at some point I was like, I gotta go to the bathroom. So I go, and uh, and I go to the bathroom. And I'm at a stall. And there's, you know, it's a party. There's a lot of people drinking, so the stalls are all filled up. So I walk in. I go to the bathroom. Uh, and next thing I know, you know, I'm up there peeing, and this big ass tall dude walks, and I look up, and it's Michael Jordan peeing right next to me. And I'm like, shit, I can't say anything. You can't, you can't be like, yo, it's Michael Jordan when you're taking a piss next to the dude. So <laughs> hey, I, I know MFs that would have. I know him yeah. that would have that would have took their hands right off the penis, handed him a pen, <laughs> and said, "Sign this, brother." Shoot, I mean, you just happen to have a little bit of gumption about yours, Larry. But oh, I know like that would have just started peeing all over the wall trying to get oh. the autograph. I couldn't do it, man. But I was like, "Oh snap!" So, anyways, I went, I went and, and went, and washed my hands, and left. And then after I was out, I was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something to him when he comes out." But you know, it was like. He's Michael Jordan. It's like there's a bubble of people around him at all times, basically. So it was like it was like he went to the bathroom and had like a you know like a two little minute break as he was peeing, and then he was back in there and just people were swamped all over him again. So mm -hmm. you know, but anyways, that was my little interesting thing as far as like Michael Jordan, Jill Scott, and you know, and it was funny because they were they were pitching Jill Scott as like this new sort of neo soul version of Erica Badu. So it was okay. Yeah. Well, well they, they are calling these two the Queens of, of neo soul, you know, right. um, I think I can get with that. Now, yeah. before, before I met my wife, you know, I had, I like Jill Scott. I had a thing for Miss Jill Scott and a lot of people do. Some of them don't want to come out and admit it, but there's something, 
there's just something special about Miss Scott. Not to take right. anything away from Erica Badu because she's special too. But there's oh, my this brother was friends. My brother was friends with Erica Badu. They went to college together at Grambling. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Well, because this channel got the things, we got the hashtag started. Jill Scott versus Erica Badu. They will be having a versus. It was announced on Timberland's Instagram this past weekend. It mm -hmm. will be on May the 9th. T streams, I'm giving it to you first. Who you got? My girl Jill Scott, because I'm very biased. Or are you taking that Erica Badu naming her children after numbers? No, nah, man. I think I'm gonna have to roll. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to roll with Jill. Yes. Now, now I yes, I do, I do like Erica Badu. I, I do think, too. I think over the years she's become a little bit too eccentric for, for my taste. Yeah. And uh but there is, you know, there is something about uh, there is something about Jill that, that you know that you can just sort of I'm telling you know, sort of rock with. Yeah, so I'm I'm, 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 I'm gonna have to, okay. have to go against the grain on this one, right? Oh God, you I, want some of that eccentric seasoning? I'm telling you right now. See, I love me some Jill Scott. I do. Mm -hmm. But Erica mm -hmm. Badu is she runs deep. And the thing is, let's not forget, like one of her one of her favorite one of her songs that are one of my favorite songs is Call Tyrone. <laughs> and you know, you know that's Tyrone. a song that a lot of men hate. <laughs> I love that song. And the thing is, she came up with that song just like on a whim. It was they were doing a they were doing a sound check at one of her before one of her shows and and her uh and I think it was her guitarist or somebody started playing this. This bass guitarist started playing this this riff, and she just started going with it and just freestyled the song. Her sound man recorded it, and and gave it to her, and they just made a song after it. So I'm thinking Jill Scott may have her stuff, but we never know. We might end up where Erica Badu may just actually make a new song right in the middle of her set. You you know <laughs> what I got? You know what I got to say to you about that, Larry? So. <laughs> So Jill Scott made up the song "Living Like Like It Was Golden" on a drop of a dial because somebody was playing on the piano. Next, <laughs> next. Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take anything away from Jill Scott because she, she is her stuff is on point. You know, she needs to leak some more photos because I don't know why she stopped, but you know. She started getting skinny and started feeling like, oh, this accidentally leaked out. Somebody hacked my phone. No one yeah. hacked your phone. <laughs> hey, man, look, now, we're not going to have that kind of disrespect to the great legendary Jill Scott on this YouTube channel. Now, you up there, be, you up there coming kind of sideways out your mouth talking about no, Jill man, Scott. No, man, I like them. Look, I like seeing those photos. Bring some more. Why hey, stop leaking them? Hey, man. Hey, look. <laughs> Y'all can count on this, even though they won't give us the credit that we got the hashtag started. Y'all can count that on this us. channel. Y'all can count on this channel to bring you play by play to review what happens. I guarantee you this one is going to be a whole lot better ran and done than Been what we face. yes, than what oh, we yeah. seen, than what we seen from those two men that made the men look bad. Mine is Babyface, because Babyface was ready to go. It was Teddy Riley. Babyface stuff was on yeah. point. Teddy yeah, Babyface was ready to go. Yeah, yeah, so, all right, folks. Last thing we're going to talk about in, in the movie realm is Marvel had some photos leaked, and it's causing speculation to wonder, is this movie going to go to video on demand, or is it going to stay in theater? Take a look at what we're talking about. What you're seeing right here are leaked photos from New Mutants. First one you saw Ooh. was Cecilia Ray's power. Second one you see Magic standing in front of the dimension of Limbo. Then you got the Demon Bear. He's going to be the main antagonist. And you can see he's an ugly you-know-what. And then lastly, Ooh. you got the Tooth Monster. And that's something that we haven't seen much of from this movie, The New Mutants. Now, if you guys don't know anything about The New Mutants, it was made two years ago, fellas, two years ago by Fox when they had yeah. some of the, the X-Men Marvel properties, right? And they kept pushing it back, pushing it back. Now, Marvel has control of it. It was supposed to get released very soon, but we got coronavirus. Yeah. So, so now the thought is in the air that because these scenes got leaked, are they leaning toward dropping it on Disney Plus? Um, 
around the holiday if we're still kind of stuck with COVID-19 or will they try to release it before Black Widow, which is supposed to come out by November? The thing is, I don't even know, fellas, if we're going to be, I don't know if we're going to be going back to the movie theater by the fall, especially with some of these cities going backwards. Could you legitimately see this that was supposed to be pushed to a movie theater put on VOD? Larry, I give it to you first. Yeah, I think I honestly believe the New Mutants is going to come out sooner than later. And the reason why I say that is it was supposed to come out. I believe it was supposed to be out like 2018 I coming week. I think it was supposed to come out like this week or something originally. Right. And then they pushed it back to uh, then they pushed it back and said they were going to release it on VOD mm -hmm. on like May 22nd. And then they what? changed it again and said that they were going to they were going to release it in the theaters, but they were going to then they pushed it all the way back to like November or December or something. Right. And so right. they kept playing with those dates, but the fact that they had already at one point decided they were going to put it out on on video on streaming tells me that they may be looking at this situation now and saying, "Hey, even if even if we were to push it back and release it in the theaters, we may not make as much money doing a theatrical release than we would by simply putting it out on, on video, on streaming. Because even if we wait till the end of the year, there's still going to be all kinds of capacity restrictions in the theater. So if mm -hmm. you have a 300 seat theater and they say you can only operate at one quarter, you know, at, at one quarter of your capacity. Well, that's just I mean, you're, you're talking about 75 people in a 300 seat theater. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know how they expect they're going to make all their, their hundreds of millions of dollars like that. They'd be better off just either releasing it on the Disney app, the Disney Plus app or or, uh, you know, maybe doing like a, a pay-per-view, you know, a rental mm. thing. And then after a certain period of time, then putting it on the Disney Plus app. I don't know. So T-Streams, could Marvel pull what they done with, with Trolls? And Trolls made $100 million, and this movie was very low budget. Was and it really? So, yeah, it was very low budget. So could Marvel pull the same thing that was done by Universal and Trolls with New Mutants? Right. That would probably be the that would probably be the best idea to try, especially if the movie is already two years old. Um, you don't want to just continue to, to sit on it. You, you keep sitting on it. Is gonna is gonna eventually lose is is gonna eventually lose its appeal to those who it was initially you know appealing to or that it was marketed to. So they you know if they looking at that you know what I would do I mean I would go ahead and and push it because of the simple fact you got these other big budget releases that you already pushed back. So. Use these as a platform. Use these as a platform to try to to test the waters to see if if whether or not uh, trolls was just a, a you know a once in a while fluke or if it's something that could actually be you know that they could actually do some systematic uh, planning and, and patterning after. You, you got to have something to work with. You can't push all the movies you know out another year or so but i'm looking at the fact that 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 movie has already been made you know folks that went to the movies a long time ago was still was was seeing previews for that movie a long time ago in the theaters and you know here it is you know time is time is constantly rolling 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 so go ahead put it out on put it out on the streaming service test the water see how well it do and that will you know Along with that and a few other films that you, you're going to have to take some risk just to see. You, mm -hmm. you just can't hold everything and say, OK, we're going to get over this. We're going to get. Yeah, we're going to get over this. But damn, at what expense? Are you just going to push all movies and just hold every everything that you think is going to be good and and like high, you know, high blockbuster films and just hold them off another year or so? Uh, wait for the world to, to, to bounce back to normal. You can't, you know, you really can't do that. You know, no. some, some idiot may may think that, you know, that it would be plausible. But but with something like that, go ahead, push that out. See, you know, test the water, see how it run and then use it as a platform uh, or a guide to, to see where you, what direction you want to take future films, because they don't actually have to have all the future Marvel films. You know, they don't have to 
have them all the way out there. I think that some of them, they could actually, you know, push the stream in it, you know, if they want to as well. You know, I don't see why they didn't, you know, why they didn't do Black Widow that way. Mm. But, uh, and, and, and this is the thing when you start talking about pushing people into the streaming platforms, when you when you say, OK, we're going to release we're going to release the new mutants and then we're going to release Black Widow or something. You know, let's say that you you say you're going to you're going to do new mutants on, you know, this month in May and then you're going to do Black Widow in say July. Most people that are going to be like, oh, dang, I want to see that. I'm going to go ahead and, and subscribe. Well, most people aren't going to say, okay, well, I'm going to subscribe for, for May, and then I'll cancel it in June, and then I'll pick it back up in July. Most people are just going to keep it. People will get it, and they'll say they'll get it in, for, they'll get it in May for New Mutants. They'll, they'll just say whatever. I'll just watch whatever random stuff in June. And then they'll back in July, they'll go watch the, uh, the Black Widow. And maybe they keep, maybe they put something else after that. So they basically are, they just keep getting people to stay on the subscription and they make their money, you hmm. know, and on top of that, and I think this is something that's important to remember. I know that, that sometimes we often think about our, our 15 and $20 movie tickets. Mm -hmm. The, the actual studios don't need to sell that product for that much money when they're not having to share it with the theaters, right? you know? They don't need to sell a $20 rental. I mean, they can, but they don't really have to to make their money back. You know, they can sell, they can put that rental out there for $10 or $12, or they can just put it as a, as a part of their subscription service on Disney Plus and make their money back because they don't have to worry about sharing 50% of that profit with the theaters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can almost, I can almost guarantee you if they, if they took that and then followed it up with another one, you know, four or five, six weeks afterwards or something like that. And then maybe, you know, maybe another one that folks would see that. And, and just like you say, they, Oh shit, all oh, everything going to Disney plus or everything going to there. Well, we yeah. might let's go ahead and get it. Let's, you know, and it'll, it'll almost be like a force wave going to whatever platform is, is released to. Uh, so I think that, you know, uh, with the the previous experience and feedback from trolls, if I was, you know, if I was one of the executives over one of those, I would definitely gamble it. I mean, what the hell do you got to lose? <laughs> you know, and think, I mean, think of Netflix as a model for that. I mean, think about all the people that subscribe to Netflix for a particular TV series when they wanted to watch House of Cards. Think about how many people subscribe to that series to watch House of Cards and they stayed on there because then they offered something else or they mm -hmm. found something else on there that they liked and wanted to watch and then they keep it. Well, that somebody may have signed up for a free trial. They got their seven days free. And the next thing you know, they're paying $12 a month or $14 a month or whatever they're paying based on their their you know their subscription level and it's the same thing with disney you sign in there think about how many people signed up because they wanted to watch the mandalorian and they still have that subscription right you know it could definitely work and speaking of disney that brings us to our next subject which is the finances and marvel and disney is a big uproar today in the stock market we're going to be reviewing the robin hood app and in reviewing this app, I'm gonna go ahead and click on and show you guys the screen here. We had a question too from uh, we had a question too from uh, from Howard McQuarters about Berkshire Hathaway selling its airline stock. So you might want to touch on that. I, I will. Segment. I will. We're gonna be doing a giveaway to two people, T Streams and me, who download the Robinhood app. The link is in the video description, and we're gonna randomly pick two individuals, and you guys are gonna get five hundred dollars to be used to invest, particularly in this app, because we want to track you and see what happens. You cool with that, T-Streams? I'm good. He's good. <laughs> so this, this thing that you're seeing on the screen is the Robinhood app. It is a free app that allows you to make trades, buy and sell stock seamlessly. And one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about Disney is because all the analysts are saying that Disney – it's going to tank to about $95. And when it gets to that point, you need to buy yourself a whole bunch of it. The reason they're estimating it's going to tank is because Disney 
theme parks are not opening up at all this year. They're done. But what is driving revenue is the success of Disney Plus. Did and they already call the whole year for the for the parks? Pretty much, man. In America, anyway, pretty much. They're now, not you hit something about NBA playing there or something. Yeah, and, and they're going. The NBA is debating: Are they going to play without people watching in some of their theme parks and studios? Wow. Um, it's folks. Wow. It's it's crazy out here. But once you get the Robinhood app, it allows you to keep up with what your stocks are doing, and you can see other stocks. You can create a playlist, which is right here, for example, with Disney. And what I always tell people to do whenever they're thinking about buying a stock, always go down here and check what it's done over the course of time. First thing I click on is the five-year button. And in the last five years, if you take Disney as a particular stock, it's lost 8.4%, which is $9. It's lost $9. It's not bad. And in the last year, it's lost... 22%. That's horrible. And then in three year, three month period, it's lost 40%. And you guys know that's mainly because of coronavirus. And with the other thing I encourage people to do when you do buy stocks, you also want to leverage your stocks with government bonds, such as this one right here that I have, which is a US Treasury bond. And when you check on this five year status, it stayed in the green 11% gain. So you want to leverage the riskier stocks with I bonds such as this, treasury bonds such as this. And to answer my man McQuarter's question, one of the reasons why people are selling airline stock is because my man Warren Buffett jumped off all of them. He jumped off all of them. And last week it was said that American Airlines is probably going to wind up tanking down by the end of this week to a dollar. And last I checked, it was right at 11 bucks. So anybody that's got money in American Airlines, you're about to lose money. However, American Airlines is not the only game in town. You do got Southwest, who is the number one domestic flyer in America. You still have Boeing, who just spent a lot of money to buy new jets. And anytime a company invests capital into equipment, that's a sign that they know something is coming in the future. So maybe it was more so that Warren Buffett doesn't believe in American Airlines and Delta as you have some of the other ones. Um, T if they take down to a dollar, I'm buying them at a dollar because American Airlines assets are worth more than a dollar a share. And I mean, if they just were sold off. Just their physical assets are worth more than that. But the thing is, you don't know someone might come in and buy and reallocate those assets from American Airlines. You know, and absorb all that. But I will say this. They are talking about of all the airlines, American Airlines specifically could be getting its own stimulus package. Mm -hmm. it's, okay. the weakest, it's the weakest out of all of them. And a lot of news was rumbling last week that they could be getting their own stimulus package, especially if they wind up stock prices drop to a dollar. There's been talk that there, there's been talk that I've heard that, that people have been saying it's time to nationalize our airlines. And I know that people in this country have a real, you know, have a real adverse, uh, 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 yeah, you know, effect to, to socializing anything. But we do already in a certain sense where I mean, not totally social, you're not totally, you know, socialized it. But I mean, when you look at stuff like our utilities, that stuff is highly, highly regulated by the government. You, and right. I think if I think if they did something like that with the airlines, it might provide the airlines some protection at a certain level. It'll provide the consumers some protection. It may actually protect the industry. The but, problem, the problem with that is you've got too many other players who feel like they're doing well enough that they're not going to want to see the government take one of those airlines. Let's say they did nationalize American Airlines, then you're going to feel like probably the other airlines are going to feel like the government is going to make their airline in a manner where they can't compete with it. Right. To, to yeah, that would degree. probably happen on some level. There would be a lot of price controls there. Right. So I, I do, I mean, I don't see the, I don't see the airline lobby allowing that to happen. Not with yeah. who we have in the white house now for sure. And if right. this person gets reelected, it definitely ain't going to happen. Yeah. But the problem, the problem with the airlines is that they've already, they've already talked about that. 
that they're not going to get back to normal flying and normal, you know, normal capacities for. It's going. I mean, they, they said it could be it could be upwards of a year before they can right. even consider going back to the normal flight capacities, mm -hmm. and. Some of these I mean, flights they haven't been adhering to the social distancing thing where they've been packing these flights when they're not supposed to. Right. You know, but it, I can see why he would I can see why he would dump them because because Warren Buffett, you know, anybody who's listened to Warren Buffett or read any of his stuff. Warren Buffett is not a day trader. A lot often type people are looking for those these quick, you know, what should I buy now? What should I sell now? Warren Buffett is someone who's who very much advocates buying and selling with long-term interest in mind. And, he and I'm the same exact way. Same and if he doesn't way. see, if he's selling his airline stocks is because he does not see that this is a good long-term prospect, mm -hmm. you know? Not right so. now anyway. T. Strange, drop some knowledge on it. What stocks do you like? What companies do you feel like you could bank on if you had to buy a stock today? Man, honestly, man, right now, I think some 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 good things to get off into is is stuff like cleaning supplies and and chemical companies. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I've been checking some of them out through mutual funds. And so the, for those that don't know uh, the difference between stocks and mutuals, uh, stocks are more so single. Mm -hmm. So you buy a single stock and whereas mutual funds, you you buy a group, you know, there's a group of them inside of that actual mutual fund. So, so, um, I think that's a, that's an actual, that's an actual strong point and, uh, things that, you know, you, you see, you, you can visually look at the, the current state of the economy and see what's actually going strong. Mm -hmm. Walmart, Target, you know, these places that, that, why everything else is, you know, Amazon, why everything else is sort of shut down and deplete. Now, of course, stuff like that is, you know, it's probably not a, a, an actual good time to buy because some of those things are extremely high now. Mm -hmm. But uh, for those who, who did get a piece of, you know, who did get a piece of that pie when it was when it was manageable, uh, probably sitting there with smiling faces right now. Um but I, I think that's that's to go around. But then on the on the flip side, on the flip side, too, there there there's also a flip conundrum to this here. If you have, you know, if you have the uh, the extra cash to to say, you know, invest a few hundred here, a few hundred there or something like that, maybe it's good to look at some things that that are, you know, inherently that's still sticking around. But you know, that's on the low end right now, but are are definitely livelihood essentials that, you know, we're not going to get away. You know, that's just going to disappear and go away. These things that are going to come back. And as soon as uh, as soon as things are actually open for the you know, for the for the rebound, they're probably going to catch and go straight, you know, straight back up. And that was one of the things I was sharing, you know, I was sharing with my with my wife. I said, well. Maybe we can take, maybe we can take some cash and get something that's that's an already you know that's an already tanked and that's right here at the bottom. Mm -hmm. We know that it's not. We know for a fact it's not going to stay there as soon as things curve back around. So so we so so you you know take some money, set it to the side, and just don't even don't even look at it, don't even follow it. For the next several months, let it go up and down, up and down, up and down like it's going to do. And then, you know, we'll take a look. We'll take a look back at it 18, 24 months from now and see, you know, see, you know, see, see if that thousand dollars was was actually, you know, you know, worth it to see, you know, to see if there was some some change. Um, so. So I so those are the you know that would be the the two directions that I would you know that I would actually look at. But then again, I'm a little bit more I'm a little bit more spontaneously risky than. <laughs> than <laughs> so. You you are, but what you do that smart is you're leveraging the riskiness with ETFs, yeah. and that's why I tell everybody if you alert if you're gonna allot a pile of money. Take half of it and invest it in something safe, like the bonds I sold you, or ETL. Mm -hmm. Then take the rest and invest in the company you like. And I give you guys another stock tip. Um, I did a video about it 
but I just haven't showed you the results. Y'all know I own a Tesla. That stock is as hot as ice cream on a Sunday in the summer in the South. I bought it when the crash first hit last month for 400 and like 90 bucks. Here we are in May and the stock is sitting at $710 a month later. A wow. month later, the number one the number one voice in electronic cars is Tesla. But this is what a lot of people don't know. They're also the number one voice for car manufacturers making self-driving cars. So not only are they selling electric Teslas, but they're also making money off the patent that Tesla has for their self-driving technology that they are in negotiations with right now to put in electric Fords, to put in some of the manufacturer who's trying to do deals with Uber. Grab you some Tesla right now while some of the plants are shut down. If you can afford $700, get a few and sit on it. And we're going to have to come back and have this discussion Christmas time. I guarantee you, you won't be disappointed. Yeah. You know, J. Crew or not. Yeah. J. Crew just uh, filed for bankruptcy. So it yeah. might be a good time to start shorting retail stocks. But I yeah. mean, that, that could be a little risky. But I mean, there's there's. There is an upside if you get it right, but if, you if know, some of these retailers out there, places you know places like J Crew and and, yeah. and Old Navy, places that are dependent upon you going in and shopping and and buying, you know, trying stuff on stuff like those. Those places are getting hit real hard, and mm -hmm. they're going to continue to get hit really hard. So to yeah. to expand on what Larry is saying, yes, they they are tanking badly. But people that you would want to invest money in that is a retailer, any retailer that has a strong online presence. Um, well, that's why I was saying short them. Right, right. Any one of those people that have beefed up their online presence is definitely one you want to buy stock in, especially maybe around September, right before the Christmas push. Because even if we still can't go shopping, people still going to get Christmas gift. They're just going to have to order it online. So you think about a lot of your online retailers who do big business, even some of your warehouse stores. Costco is doing great. Um, Sam's Club is doing great, but they're they are in-house with Walmart. So think of some of those stocks and go on ahead and get you some and just ride it out in the sunset. Man, right. have we, also, we also have to consider. Go ahead. I'm sorry. T, I'm sorry. T, go ahead. I was, I was just I was just looking at. And I just pulled up a couple of stocks, and I I pulled Walmart. At Walmart was at was at a uh, was at a hundred and twenty three uh, hundred and twenty three three dollars uh, mm -hmm. per stock. And I had had anybody uh, took a look at what Amazon's was. Oh my God! I, I know. I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about it. They are they are killing right now. Killing. Amazon is over twenty three hundred. Killing it. And last year at this time, they was like twelve hundred. Yeah, man. man. So yeah, I, I you know, I think that moving forward, some of those stocks are going to continue to 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 do really well. I think some of that's going to level out as some of this stuff starts to settle down. Yeah, and it but, will. but we're not we're not ever going back to the way we were. I shouldn't say ever, but we're not going back to the way we were anytime soon. No, and, not definitely not this year. Definitely. And not. all these people who think like, oh, we're going to open things back up because we've been having all these protests. If you watch the news and you see there's been spikes and all these places oh, where people oh, have been protesting. Hold that, thought, been Larry. Let, hold that thought because that's coming up next. We're going right okay. into politics right now. Yeah. And right. what you're about to say works with what we're talking about. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you guys don't know Larry's Republican girlfriend, her name is Candace Owens. <laughs> not mine. <laughs> she got her ass banned. And when I say banned, I mean with a capital B from Twitter. Ooh. Take a look at this. Man, I got to fix my DJ. Candace Owens, a conservative commentator and online activist, claims she was suspended from Twitter following a tweet criticizing Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer's stay-at-home order and encouraging the state's citizen to violate the directive. Twitter flagged Owens' tweet for violating the site's policies, according to the news source Mediaite. Owens alerted several conservative colleagues of her suspended account following her critique of Whitmer. 
A spokeswoman for Twitter confirmed to The Hill that Owens's tweet violated the platform's COVID-19 misinformation policy, quote, specifically around heightened risk health claims. <laughs> now, Larry, dig on in what it, it, it ties right into what you were saying. What do you think about Candace Owens and why are these people so hell bent on making the time longer in which we can heal the, the economy and heal people's health? See, this, this, is, this is the crazy thing, right? I feel like these people, well, I don't feel, I know for a fact, these people out there that are listening to these conservative, you know, pundits that are, they're talk show hosts, these bloggers, they're being used as pawns mm -hmm. and they're being used in a really deadly game of chess, real life chess where people are dying. Mm -hmm. And like, if you listen to like, if look at this, I'm going to read you one of her tweets, right? She wrote, <laughs> a couple of days ago, she put, apparently, Governor Whitmer believes she is a duly elected dictator to a socialist country. What? The people of Michigan need to stand up to her, open your businesses, go to work. The police think she's crazy, too. They oh. are not going to arrest 10 million people for going to work. Oh, that, my Lord. That, that she, is, she is clearly, clearly telling people to go out there mm. and break the law. Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, she should have been banned. But here's the thing. What people don't seem to understand is that if you go out there and you do what these people are saying and you just say, I'm going to put all this, all caution to the wind, I'm going, I'm opening my business or I'm going to work. You could die as a consequence. You could die. You could cause other people to die as a consequence. And when people are basically, when you, when all of a sudden, if there's another big explosion, a big peak where everything happens, where all of a sudden our, our, our hospitals are flooded and people can't get a hospital bed and all the craziness is going on, the rest of the country looks like New York did, you know, there's going to be a, a, a complete national shutdown in its entirety. And what do you think your business is going to happen? What, what's going to happen to your business then? What happens when, when so many people get sick and die? That it changes the, the the permanent mindset and the culture of the American people. So your business, even if they lift the ban, your business is no longer viable because people no longer want to do business in the same way. So mm -hmm. people really need to stop listening to these people like Candace Owens and they need to think through this problem and realize that if they don't solve it in the right way, they can lose their livelihood in its entirety. You know, and this is one of these reasons why I just think I feel like the whole dumbing down of the American educational system has really caused a lot of this because they, they used to teach critical thinking in schools and people used to be able to look at this crap and read this crap and think through the problems and they can't do it anymore. They're all they've, they've been dumbed down. Hmm. Yeah. They don't. I mean, critical thinking is a skill that is taught. It's not. Some people do it naturally, just like some people can dunk a ball naturally. Some people can run fast naturally. Most people have to train. Critical thinking is something that you have to be taught for most people. And we don't teach it anymore. So you can get over on these people because they are ignorant. And I don't mean ignorant in the pejorative. I mean ignorant as in the dictionary definition. Yeah. T-Streams, they, well, they're trying to get your girl Meg. You know, I, I, got, I, got, I got something to say. You know, see, uh, <laughs> as, as a quick response to him, man, uh, critical thinking, I think, sort of went out the door a few years ago, man. I, I'm not sure what folks thinking about now. But um, anyhow, uh, she she better slow. She better slow a roll, man. They didn't uh, You know, <laughs> she's probably the, the governor here is getting a lot of she's getting a lot of slack, but she's also getting a whole lot of support from here. You know, I don't know if you guys I don't know if you guys seen it, man, but uh, here they call her. They call her Big Gretch. Yeah. Yeah. I know they love her in the D. They man. love her in the D. And so one of the one of the rappers here put out a little rap video with her and threw on some buffs. And for those of you that do not know what buffs is, buffs is a pair of um, they're a pair of um, iced out. Buffalo horn Cartier glasses. All right. And so it's it's a staple here in Detroit, you know. So when somebody say I got I got my all white buffs on, that means they got the white buffalo horn uh Cartier glasses. So I thought it was actually 
I thought it was actually a joke until I till I saw it with my own eyes. They then threw the meme up with her, and I, I shared it. Um, I shared it on my page and threw the buffs on her, and then. <laughs> and then you know they actually started to go <laughs> only in Detroit do they do dumb stuff like this man. <laughs> they started a GoFundMe fund to buy the governor a pair of iced out buffalo horn Cartier glasses What? and has yeah man dude you should check, check my page man I, I, I swear it I, you can't make this stuff up and the crazy thing about it is they didn't already raise several thousand dollars to buy the woman a pair. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you how silly things is, man. What in the hell? These folks, you know, they they look into her strangely, man. They they look into her strangely. All right, now, and she she she's a woman. She's a governor. She got a job to do. The the heroic aspect of it, I think they taking it a little too they taking it a little too far, and then. Who in the hell, who in the hell just comes out the blue to buy, you know, she can buy her own four or five thousand dollar pair of glasses if she wanted to buy them. And then she ain't no she ain't no street thought or no no D boy. So it really ain't, you know, she don't even need them. <laughs> I mean, the other part is she can't even accept them. No, she can't. She and can't. They're too expensive. That's gonna be over that threshold. She can't even accept them. And, and so, who who's running the, the GoFundMe page? The dude that made the rap song. His name is uh I, I want to say it was uh G Cash. Oh, you I don't need to know his name. I just yeah. want to know what he's gonna do with the cash because she ain't gonna take the glasses. I don't know, man. When I when I last looked, I think it was like it was already like over three thousand dollars. What? And so yeah. Wow. Yeah, so, so. And so they consider they consider they consider that like the the hood keys to the city. Like mm -hmm. you know, they, they took Andre Drummond's back. So, so, so <laughs> they they, re they revoked his and I, and they gave they gave him to the governor. So uh so I don't know. So, so she she's out posting, you know, she's out posting uh little self portraits holding you see did you see her little her and her little cup that says yeah how to be a michigan gangster or yeah something? man see uh, and I, i'm woman you 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 threading on thin ice now you, you you might be on the you might be on the route to the white house don't don't let these goons down here in the motor city get you derailed because they will Get your whole thing effed up, you know. What what, I mean? Well, what what about the goons that keep showing up to her house and keep showing up to the Capitol building? What about those goons? Well, I'm 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 gonna tell you this, and this is this is what I see. This and uh, now this is all seriousness, but this is also shows you how foolish people can be. Right. All right. Now I'm looking at the I'm looking at the the comments and the threads. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just from just from me, and I, I'm sure that her security detail and all of this see the exact same thing. You can see stuff brewing in the comments of some of those in the comments of some of those sections. So it's it's circulating really really heavy around here, and you got folks that's actually you you got folks that's actually saying, you know, trying to orchestrate or promote the propaganda that it would be a good idea to march and confront the white boys, you know, with, you know, with their rifles and all this other kind of stuff and see, you know, you know, see, see what happens and comes up out of that, man, it's really, really getting retorted, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I'm, what I'm seeing is they, they, they are looking, they, they have took her from being a, a governor to some type of being looked at like some type of demigod here, man. I I, I spent several hours today looking at stuff um, strictly pertaining to her and what I was, you know, what I'm picking up in some of these uh, quotes and stuff. And it's re it's it's creating a a you know it's creating a real real fine line. And it could actually have some type of adverse effect towards her, 
you know, even though she's not even though she's not directly involved, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? And so it's 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 just something that I'm it's something that I'm going to watch because next thing, you know, they they are trying to they are trying to conjure it up and get the balls to to do that kind of stuff. And so, you know, everybody with criminal records, everybody with bench warrants, everybody with child support or anything that the police can scratch with you about, they ain't going to do it. So they they are looking for those who who are legitimate and that can, you know, that can weather that little storm. So right now they're just trying to beef everybody up. And I'm like, man, I'll do tell you, you who they need to call to get up in there. They need to call Antifa. Tell them <laughs> to come out. Hmm. You know, Boy. Antifa's a bunch of crazy anarchist white boys. They're like, they're, they're like, you know what? We're white. We're not getting arrested like you guys would. And if we get arrested, once we take off all of our little face masks, they're just going to see their sons and daughters. They're going to be like, oh, okay, whatever. You can go on your own recognizance or we're dropping the charges. That's what happens with them. They can come back and they can respond to those, to those types because they can. Where us. You know, we show up just with a sign, and all of a sudden now we might end up locked up for some conspiracy charge. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, and 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 that was uh, you know, that was sort of uh, you know, and is is being is visibly seen here, and so like with the protests there in in Lansing, you know, the there was you know there was a <laughs> gathering yes there was a gathering yesterday I believe it was, and. Uh, there was no there was no guns involved, but it was all people of color. Hmm. Police and state troopers came in, disbanded. It would it what? wasn't it, it wasn't even a quarter of the size of what was at the state capitol, but the police came and disbanded it, and you know started passing out tickets and sent everybody home. And He's so what loud everybody up was why in the hell is they doing this? But you can actually you can walk clean through the doors. Of the state capitol with AR-15s and all this other kind of stuff tied around your neck and not get a single ticket, take pictures with your arm around the state police and all this other kind of so is they're they're mm-hmm. silently creating, they're silently creating a war here that's that's going to, you know, if it's if it's not looked at seriously and defused. Is going to is going to escalate into something that's a lot more sinister and a lot more damaging. Well, T streams. If you're going to defuse it, the state patrol need to do the same thing that they did to absolutely. black people to the white people. Absolutely. What? Why? Why go to the path of least resistance and disband people who don't have weapons when you've got all these people with weapons who need to be disbanded? I I mean, if you don't want this thing to turn into a war. You're just gonna have to be fair on both sides. If you if you're gonna let these people protest that are black that don't have weapons, they the main ones that should be protest. They're not. They don't have weapons. No, I I'll agree. tell you what. I'll tell you what. These trains would be really interesting if black folks did show up and just showed up with and started a protect the police rally. If they came out and said, "We are not gonna let you sit up here and scream and yell and and tout your guns in front of our police officers and threaten their lives with coronavirus. We're going to be a buffer zone between you and the police and have a black people protect the police protest. Man, you talk about throwing stuff on on its head. People wouldn't know what to make of it. You know, the police would be in a weird position. They'd be like, well, damn, we can't really just start cracking heads and get rid of the people that are saying they're here to protect us. And and if the and if the white folks, the races out there start fighting with the people out there protecting the police, well, that just exposes all of who they are. I mean, and, and see, the sad thing is this police injustice that we're seeing with coronavirus is not just happening in Detroit. We had some of this foolishness going on in New York this weekend. You had yeah. cops out here handing out masks to little Susie, Morgan, Kelly, Becky, whatever you want to call her. Karen. But then, whatever. And then you had a black dude who was trying to defuse a situation with Anglos, and the police arrest him for trying to defuse a situation with Anglos. Bruh, <laughs> who we, I tell you. And at yeah. that note, fellas, I'm going to end this right there because I don't want to get T streams in no trouble. <laughs> and me and Larry got to come back tomorrow because we are interviewing Sharonda from Pay or Wait. 
we've got a black female film critic up here. She's going to discuss all the shows your wives or your girlfriends is watching. So make sure y'all tune in tomorrow at nine o'clock. She's going to give you the rundown of what it's been like for her being a black YouTuber and a female trying to review movies and her journey and give you the rundown on a couple of those good shows. Last word, T-Streams. Hey, it's warming up outside. Everybody don't play the fool. You know, <laughs> we, we, we see social media going off the chain with in, in major cities all around the country. Uh, we, we, we can't act clearly and think cognitively when the heat is getting ready to turn up. You know, it is still dangerous outside. We're still not sure, you know, how this whole situation is going to be affected with the heat and with the mingling, you know, and dumbing down of the American people right now. So please continue to uh, continue to play the safe card uh, where you, you know, wear your mask, you know, keep you some hand sanitizer if you can find it. And just uh, just continue, just continue to be smart, because uh, right now, you know, we, we have to see exactly, you know, what's getting ready to happen so that we know what to do in the future. Larry, it's on you. Yeah, I want to say I, you hadn't mentioned it yet, so I wasn't sure if you were going to or if you forgot. But I just want to say rest in peace, Don Shula. If mm -hmm. you didn't know, the winningest football coach in NFL history passed away at 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Wasn't my team, but mine had his team. So I just wanted to say, you know, rest in peace and uh you know it was fun watching fun watching the games that he coached even when you're even when you weren't rooting for him because dude was a a a genius as far as strategizing on the football field yep well i i was gonna mention that but what i was gonna say with that was you never know what might happen on the next day with your loved ones or your friends your family whoever you cherish make each and every day a highlight for them because you, tomorrow's not given. And that was going to be around Don Shula passing away. Um, he was a good coach. My team is the Miami Dolphins. And we are the only team from 1972 to go undefeated and win the Super Bowl. He coached that team. And everybody that knew him, and I had a chance to meet him in Miami myself, great dude. Uh, now, he would cuss. He let you have it. But he was real. He was the type of dude that everybody, no matter whether he was black, white, Indian, Mexican, you wanted to sit down with this guy and just have a beer with him. And to his tribute, I say to you all, treat every day like it's possibly the last with your loved one so that they know that they're loved and enjoyed. And that's going to do it for this video. Don't forget to like this video, comment, subscribe. Check out Larry on his channel. Today I feel like Check out T-Strings on his Facebook page. All those links are in the video description. And until that next Sexy as Hell video, we'll see you. Peace. Peace.